for that wonderful welcome. And indeed, I had my own welcome to you all this evening. And how lovely to see you all this sunny evening and the chance for us to talk about, or at least start an important conversation about our health, men and women's health. The taboo areas which we all shy away from not talking about. So, friends, I'm Ketan Sheth and I chair Northwest London's Joint Health Scrutiny Committee, which comprises of nine Northwest London boroughs from Hillingdon to City of Westminster. So, I get to hear a lot about NHS plans, and together with colleagues and residents, I scrutinize them. It's about accountability. How are they doing? What are their plans? Are they thinking ahead? Are they seeing ahead? We are a critical friend. We sometimes need to ask ourselves the same sort of questions about our own systems, scrutinize our own personal health. Are you thinking ahead? Are you seeing ahead? Today, we are going to be talking about, amongst other things, about waterworks, prostate and bowel wellness, just two or three several taboo health areas in a respectful, private, unembarrassing way, because you need to know when something is not right and you need to know that you can ask your doctor about it, especially the men who have tendency to ignore things, but we really do need to speak up about our own health. Friends, too many illnesses go untreated and sadly, lives are lost because we are hidden from a problem. I recently read that prevalence of prostate cancer is very high among some communities, very high. And some people don't come forward because they just don't know how to start that conversation and just put it off, thinking it will go away. So avoid the problem and so sometimes treat it too late. That's really sad, heartbreaking. So I want to start off the conversation this evening we really couldn't do justice in just 60 minutes that we have this evening. But we'll start the conversation this evening, try and break down the taboo, and hopefully to be different. Looking at the Zoom screen, I know we are very diverse lot, but shouldn't be a divided one. We want to include all and encourage all to start this conversation for ourselves and for each other. As is often the way, friends, a little education is a building block to better things and a better future. And it might actually teach us to be good listeners to each other, so that what bothers the person in front of you can be mentioned and you can support them and encourage them to talk to a doctor if needed. Don't be embarrassed. I want to see more of this type of thing. Our ability to talk about how we feel and how we are is the measure of a real community spirit. So let's start the conversation and let me introduce you to my first guest this evening, Ms. Jyoti Shah. Jyoti is a consultant urological surgeon at University Hospitals of Derby and Burton NHS Foundation Trust in the Midlands, where she has a specialist interest in general urology as well as prostate cancer. She has established a unique one-stop PSA clinic. Jyoti is a passionate campaigner for health and well-being within communities and on equality. Her pioneering campaign, Inspire Health, fighting prostate cancer screening has been going into local communities to bring about awareness of prostate cancer for some time now. And friends, I am so grateful that she has been able to find 
uh, uh, some time for us this evening from a very busy schedule. And in fact, she has just come straight from her surgery, from her clinic, uh, from her hospital to be with us on this Zoom call. So let us all introduce Jyoti this evening to say a few words about the work that she's doing in community. Jyoti, a very warm welcome to you and thank you. Thank you very much, Gidlin Bai, and good evening, everyone. Um, what an amazing turnout. Um, before I start, Gidlin Bai, do I have permission to share the screen and show my slides? Yes, please. You're the co-host as well, so you'll be able to uh, share um, slides with us, please. Coming up with a message saying host disabled participant screen and sharing. Okay, let me just, um, while you're um, just starting off, uh, I'll just ask Cleo to just make you a call. Yeah. So if you just bear with us. I've got it now, thank you. Great, thank you. Lovely, thank you. I don't think a Zoom call would be a Zoom call without a bit of a technical hitch, would it? No, so. it has to be. <laughs> So thank you very much. I've got them. Hopefully you can all see my slides now. So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me here today. And I'm ever so sorry that I've literally just walked through the door and all I had time to do was put a bit of lippy on. So there we go. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so as a disclaimer, before I start, some may say this talk, well, it is about men's health and it is about taboos and stigma. So some may argue that this needs to be an X-rated talk, so be warned. Now, I, there's absolutely no way I can talk about all of what I do um, in my work for the last nearly 30 years in 10 minutes. So I'm gonna give you a whistle-stop tour of urology and men's health, and in particular, subjects that people are actually quite embarrassed to present with. So here we go, we're gonna start in age order. So let's start with kids. And the, if there are any younger people here, then this one's for you. So what, what are we starting with? One of the most common things that I see in children as an emergency is twisted testicles. And so what happens the testicle, you know, it's all about men and their balls at the end of the day, right? So here we have a testicle and it's dangling on a cord. Now, if that twists, then you imagine that that testicle on the cord that it's dangling on will be strangulated. And what then happens is the blood supply that's coming through that cord is literally being being torn, it, it's being, it's strangled. So there's no blood going to the testicle and none of the rubbish in the testicle is going back up into the body. So what happens? There is a four to six hour window in order to save the testicle. And unfortunately, there's no test other than taking someone for an operation to make this diagnosis. So if, if there's anyone out there who has testicular pain that comes on suddenly with no trauma, i.e. you've not been kicked or punched in the ghoulies, it just comes on. And quite often, as these things are when it comes to emergencies, they always happen in the middle of the night, right? So this is me waking up and going to hospital at two, three in the morning. But if you have pain that comes on suddenly, on one side in particular, there's we've got four to six hours to save that testicle. And here is a black dead testicle. And this is what happens when we're outside that window. So moving on to the slightly older men. So now men, what happens, and in particular during intercourse, the penis has a foreskin and there's a head. And often the foreskin goes underneath the head. And therefore, again, it's a bit like strangulation. It gets stuck. And as it gets stuck, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and starts to swell. Again, the head of the penis, as you can see on my arrow that I'm showing here, starts to then swell. It's a vicious circle. The foreskin swells, the head swells, and actually then it becomes almost impossible to return that foreskin to its normal position. 
And again, this is an emergency. This is called a parathymosis and people sit on this. It's terrible. I tell you, the worst one that I've seen is what's happened is it's been there for months and months and months. And there's this cheese wiring process. If you imagine one of those sort of Russian dolls bouncing around like that, it literally was the head of this man's penis was dangling on a tiny strip of tissue because it had just eaten away over months and months. I mean, this is an emergency. So if this happens, you need to get yourself to the hospital. And that's very different to this condition, which is called a phimosis, which is where the foreskin is very tight and cannot be pulled back at all. Not, nothing to do with the swelling process, it's just tight. And there are two things that happens with this. One is that it can become so tight that men start to get problems with their waterworks because then the hole is just tiny and they can't pee through it. But, and often we see a lot of this in men with diabetes because fibrosis is common uh, with lots of sugar going out in the urine. Um, so again, if you've got this, go and see your GP. It's a really easy, well, it's an easy operation for me. It's my bread and butter operation doing a circumcision, but, but it's an easy fix actually. So don't suffer if you've got this. And that brings us to the slightly older generation. And as Githenby was referring to prostate men waterworks. So let's talk about waterworks here. So what happens? Any man over the age of 40 starts to get some degree of bother with their waterworks. So what happens? Imagine a tap and this literally is the man with a tap. So you want to go for a wee, you rush to the toilet, but when you get there, it doesn't start straight away, that's called hesitancy. So you're waiting around a little bit, and then when it starts, you can't actually hit the wall like you did when you were 20, you know that competition? So you can't do that. And then the stream itself, not only is it not very strong, but it's on and off, on and off, what we call intermittency. And then when you turn the tap off and you think you've finished your wee, then there's this dribble, as you can see in this picture here, it goes, dribble, dribble, dribble. Then you put your, put your bits away, you put your flies up, you go out and then you go, oh, got to go back again. You don't think you're quite emptying your bladder here. So what we call piece en deux, this whole French thing. Um, so you go back and you empty a little bit more or you might be going so frequently throughout the day. And in particular, prostate and men, men start to get up at night. And that really becomes a bother, particularly if you're still working and then you're exhausted because you're not getting a full night's sleep. So if you've got any of these symptoms, there are things we can do for you. And it's not always cancer. Ironically, prostate cancer, which now, by the way, as Githenby has said, is one of the most common cancers in men. One man dies every 45 minutes in this country from prostate cancer. So there's no shame. And we can treat this cancer, we can cure this cancer if you come to us early. So if you have any of this bother with the, with the waterworks, and again, go and see your GP because there are some quick fixes here. And why does all of this happen? It's all to do with this prostate. And it's great that you guys, and it's only men that have a prostate, it's great that you have it because it absolutely keeps me in a job. So it's tucked away, it's underneath the bladder, so it's well inside the body. Um, and, and that's why often, you don't necessarily get the symptoms of cancer until it really is quite late. So, but the most common scenario here is that any man over the age of 40, the prostate grows. It's just a bit like as we get older and our hair gets greyer, in the same way as men get older, over the age of 40, this prostate grows. So, there's the bladder, you can see that up there, here's the bladder, underneath it, that red thing there, that's the prostate, and the pipe men pee from runs through the prostate. If you imagine an apple, it's like the core of an apple, so it runs through the prostate. So what happens? The prostate grows and it grows outwards, but of course it's going to grow inwards as well, and it's going to squash the core. So what happens? Imagine a shower, you're going for a shower, and if all your taps are furred, you're not going to get the power shower. And in the same way, you can see in the two pictures at the bottom, there's a big wide pipe here with a normal prostate, but then here it starts to get narrowed. And that's why you start to get all this bother. 
And again, the way we examine the prostate, if you look up there, it's the prostate sits in front of the back passage. So of course, you've got to lie down on your left hand side and my magic finger goes up the back passage. That's the only way to feel the prostate. So again, absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about. I've lost track of how many thousands. Um, my husband wants to insure my finger, but there we go. Um, so just a reminder that if there are waterwork problems, there's a lot of things that you can do for yourself because the most common scenario is that the prostate has grown and it's not necessarily cancer. So what can you do? There are lots of things that you can look at with your drinking and change your drinking. If you're drinking before you go to bed at night, well then don't because that's the body's got to manage that. If you have, you know, all these men who have, go to the pub and have three pints of beer and then say, oh, but I'm getting up four times a night. Well, you know, actions and consequences. You're gonna drink your beer, you're gonna get up at night. Don't drink your beer, you're more probably not going to get up at night. So there's things that you can do for yourself. Um, there are tablets that we can give you to relax the prostate, to make that pipe wider. Um, there are tablets we can give you if you've got to rush to the toilet, gotta to go, gotta go, can't hold on again. These are really quite simple fixes. One doesn't need to suffer with this stuff. And finally, if the prostate is so enlarged and it's causing a degree of blockage. Now, if you look at the two pictures at the bottom, the one on the, the furthest away on the right shows that the two halves of the prostate are sort of almost kissing each other in the middle and that pipe is narrowed. So what do we do? We do this operation called a TERP, most common operation, one of the most common operations I do. And that's the picture on the left. And this loop basically shaves away slivers of the prostate to make that pipe wider again and it literally is like coring the apple so quick fixes go and speak to your gp get referred to someone like me we can sort it sometimes this is what happens and we see this sometimes in foreskins that are so tight that people stop peeing altogether. If your prostate's enlarged it's your 60th birthday and you go out and you have lots of beers this critical point comes where you stop peeing altogether. And that lump you can see in the middle here, that's a bladder. And this guy's desperate for a wee, but can't go. So what do we do? We put a tube in, it's called a catheter. And that, I mean, I tell you, I go to A&E sometimes when people are in what we call retention, they can't pass urine. And it's amazing, they're given morphine and they're given this, and actually all they need is this tube and it's magic. And I've done it once with a straw on a plane because they didn't have a catheter but it works magic. And, so, and if we can't get it through because the two halves of the prostate is so tight, you can't actually even get the, the catheter past it, then sometimes we have to put a catheter through the tummy directly into the bladder. Okay, because you remember that picture of the man with the lump? Well, that's, we, can, we can put a needle or a catheter straight in and that'll go directly in the bladder and that will relieve his pain. So again, a quick fix, no shame. Colour of urine. So this is really important. If it's light, it's good. So drink plenty, keep your urine flushed out, and it's going to be at that at the left end spectrum, sort of clear. Um, I'm sure you've all seen for yourself that when you drink plenty, it's clear, it's slight light yellow. But actually, if you're really dehydrated, particularly on a sunny day, you've not drunk, it starts to get dark, it starts to get brown. So you can tell by the colour of your urine actually how much you're drinking. But if it ends up this colour, that's a problem. And this again is something you'd be surprised. That's actually a picture of my father-in-law's urine. So needless to say, uh, we admitted him and uh, he needed a bit of a fix. But, they, you know, we'd sat on this for a week and I've just seen a chap the other day who has basically had this coloured blood in the urine for almost six months. And I don't know whether it was because it's locked down and the government said, don't go and see your GP, don't go to A&E, but he just sat on it. Now, that's not a good thing to do. And again, this is one of the most common things I see through the emergency department. Get yourself seen to get to your GP or come to us. So what do we do? We'll do a few tests. Now this is a plain x-ray and all those white blobs at the bottom, all these round things down here, this man's bladder is full of millions of stones as you can see. So there's no surprise that all those stones in the bladder were going to cause some bleeding. What about this? Another really common scenario. Now there's the left kidney 
I'm assuming you can all see my arrow pointing to things. Um, so there's the left kidney. This is a CT scan. Here's the right kidney. Now there's a pipe that connects the left kidney and here's the bladder. So on both sides, here you see the pipe going down. That's called the ureter. So that pipe on each side, urine made in the kidney goes down the pipe into the bladder. That's where the urine is then stored until we're ready to wee. And this white, so anything with calcium has got, is white. So these are bones. And this is like, if you imagine a loaf of bread going from front to back of the loaf, this is from front to back of you. And see that little white speck here? So in that pipe, which above here is a bit swollen, again, it's basic plumbing, in the pipe here is a white stone. And therefore, because that stone is causing a blockage, above it, the urine can't get past it. So it all starts to swell a little bit. So that's a stone. Again, really easy. One of, one of the most common things I see again. Um, and that often needs an operation to fix. And then we start getting to the nasty things. Right kidney, left kidney. And here you see a big lump. And that's a kidney cancer. And again, I've seen a lot of people come very late, whether that's lockdown, whether that's COVID, who knows, but people have sat on their symptoms. And, you know, when we get signs in our body, it's a sign that there's something going on. So we really shouldn't ignore it, regardless of what we think the stigma might be. And finally, if you come to us with blood in the urine, this is a really quick test. I mean, as you've probably worked out already, I like poking people, whether it's my finger or with instruments. And this is an instrument. And this is called a cystoscope, a flexible cystoscope. And that long, thin tube there, we pass it up in men through the penis under local anaesthetic. And we have a look inside the bladder when they come with the red urine. And unfortunately, we see mischief like this. Look, at, it looks ever so pretty, doesn't it? It's like coral reef, all this stuff. But it is cancer. This is bladder cancer. And again, this is the sort of stuff that could be going on. So we need to investigate you. We need to, we need to get you better. So if you have signs like this, please don't ignore them. There's, no, there's absolutely no shame. There's no embarrassment. And I can tell you, we'll have seen it all before. So get yourself seen to if you've got anything like this. A final word about prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is known as a silent killer. And the reason is often it doesn't manifest until it, it has spread. So if you're worried about prostate cancer, in particular, if you're from uh, an African Caribbean background, your risk is two and a half times greater than Caucasian men. If you have a family history, your father, your father's brother, so paternal link, not maternal link, it's paternal link, or your own brother has prostate cancer, again, your risk is doubled. So get yourself seen to. Go and ask your GP for a PSA blood test. It's as simple as that. And again, there's no shame. You're entitled to it, providing you're over 50. I'm sure there's lots of questions from right. that. You can get them by. We'll thank you very later. much. Thank, so you. thank you very much for that uh, fantastic overview. Uh, it's been a uh, really, really eye opener for uh, I'm sure many of us, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. But uh, as I said in my opening words, this is uh, a starting of the conversation uh, and uh, we'll continue the conversation. Um, you were mentioning uh, GP and uh, our next uh, uh, friend is indeed uh, a senior GP. Kathy, uh, Dr. Kathy Bakai. Uh, she's a partner at St. Andrew's Health Centre, which is part of Bromley by Bo Health Partnership in East London. She's also uh, been leading work in Tower Hamlets on a borough-wide prescribing and primary care transformation, including her innovative work with the pharmacists. So friends like Jyoti Ben, uh, Kathy Ben is also committed to supporting communities and bringing awareness and tackling health inequalities. She's much sought after speaker uh, at a wide range of community health events. And we are so lucky that despite her busy GP practice, uh, she's found some time you know, to be with us this evening. So uh, Kathy Ben, a uh, really warm welcome to you. And uh, she's going to tell us about um, cervical health, 
uh, uh, bowel health and uh, breast health. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for inviting me here today, everybody. And thank you, Jyoti Wen, for a really lovely talk. Um, as hopefully everyone will agree, really nicely put and hopefully takes a lot of the stigma and taboo away from some difficult topics. Um, you mentioned in your talk several times about going to see your GP, so I'd just like to start the talk by saying to everybody that your GP is open. We've always been open. We've always been seeing people when needed face to face as well throughout the pandemic, and we continue to do so. It may be that the way you access your doctor, your GP has changed now and widely across the country, we are now uh, asking people to provide information via telephone or via, via online consultation to tell us what um, their need are, what needs are, what the problems are, so that we can get you seen in the best way possible by the best person possible for you. So don't feel like there is a barrier to you actually being seen. It's just working in a slightly different way, but we're open and we're here for you. Um, I've been told by Gidden that there are lots of different types of people in our audience today. Um, people from the community, people from the health sector, people from the social sector. And we are talking about taboo subjects today. And I'd like to, to compliment um, Jyoti's talk and actually balance it by talking about women's health. Um, there is a lot like men's health, there's a lot to say about women's health, specific needs of women. And women's roles are actually changing within the community, within all communities, actually. Um, in lots of communities, females are the primary caregivers, primary homemakers, um, the people that will look after the elderly, look after the children. Um, and, and actually more and more uh, women are going into work from those communities as well. And we have a whole, uh, a whole sort of spectrum where actually females are now um, the main earners in the families as well. So we have to understand and acknowledge that women's roles have changed and are changing within different communities, but often at the cost of neglect of their own health. And that's what I want to talk about today because Women's health varies as as age cha as um, and changes with age, and it starts from things like period problems in early ages. It moves on in twenties and thirties around things to do with fertility and infertility sometimes, which women often take majority of the responsibility for, even if that's not the case. During pregnancy, there's issues around maternal health. And after pregnancy, there can be various issues related to changes, uh, changes of the body from pregnancy, which can include one of the things that Jyoti talked about, which is bladder health and bladder weakness. After that, women have other things to look forward to, like the menopause and symptoms related to that. Um, and, and all of this is alongside all the other medical issues that can happen to anybody. It's not all doom or gloom, doom and gloom, though. There are a lot of these things which are preventable and um, exercise, good diet, good sleep works wonders. Actually having a good, healthy body weight and exercising in itself is an, is an antidote to a lot of these problems that we talk about today. So we must hold that central. I've only got a short amount of time to speak to you today about women's health. So I thought I would focus on cancer screening, actually. This is something that has um, gone down during the pandemic and actually women attending for screening of cancer has reduced. And we want to make sure, we want to talk about it today so that we can make sure that women are taking advantage of cancer screening and know about it. So here, I'm just trying to share my slides. I'd like to start by talking about breast screening. So the reason breast screening is important is because breast cancer is the commonest cancer in the UK. Now, breast screening uptake is much lower in Indian women than white women and actually women from other ethnic minority backgrounds as well. So there is a clear disparity there. Breast cancer screening program reduces the risk of dying from breast cancer by 20%. So we know that it works. 
And we know that one in eight women will develop breast cancer. So in this room, we've got about 60 odd people. We know that about six of us at some point, six to eight of us at some point will develop um, breast cancer in our lifetime. So that's a huge number. And actually, if we can reduce the risk of dying from breast cancer by even one or two in this room, that's huge. Now, breast screening um, is available for anyone registered with the GP um, and will, you'll be invited to attend for breast screening every three years between the ages of 50 to 71. You'll usually get a letter in the post inviting you. And if you've missed it, if you've just remembered because I've spoken about it, um, there's a way to actually make sure that you go back into this cycle by contacting your local breast screening service. Breast screening is actually for people who don't have symptoms. So this is for just anybody. Uh, between those ages. If you have symptoms, you do not wait for your breast screening call. You actually go and come and see us in the practice and ask for an examination so that we can check your breasts. Now, breast screening is um, done via something called a mammogram. And to when you attend for the mammogram, usually the, uh, the people helping you there will be female, but you could always ask for a female specifically if this is something that you're worried about. Um, and a mam mammogram isn't something that's invasive or painful. It's a scan that's done with your breasts being almost squashed a little bit against a machine. It's not painful. It can be a little bit uncomfortable, but it doesn't last long. If there are any problems in the mammogram, if it picks up that you may have a risk of cancer, then you are invited to have some further examinations and testing done in a specialist breast clinic. And But the important thing to remember is that not everything that's picked up in a um, mammogram will be cancer and not all cancers are picked up in a mammogram. It's not 100% foolproof. So if you have symptoms, symptoms such as a breast lump, symptoms such as um, bloody discharge coming out of your nipple or asymmetry in your breasts, then these are all reasons why you should go, come and visit us in the general practice so that we can examine you, check you and advise you appropriately. The next thing I want to highlight is something called um, cervical screening. Now, cervical screening, just firstly, what is the cervix? The cervix is the entrance to the womb. So you can see this bottom picture here. When I, I, I use this implement called a speculum, it's inserted inside the vagina and it's opened up ever so slightly like it's shown here. And through the back of the speculum, I can see the inside at the back of the vagina, this cervix. This is a healthy cervix. And this little hole in the middle is the entrance to the womb. And this is where we take some samples for your cervical screening from. Now, again, this procedure, it can be uncomfortable for women and lots and lots of women put off going to see the GP for their cervical screening because it's an internal examination. It's something that they're not very comfortable with doing. But again, I want to reassure women that we do this day in and day out. If it's uncomfortable, we can take our time, we can talk you through it. And at any point, if you want to stop, you are in control and you can ask to stop and maybe come back another time to do it. Um, and there's absolutely no shame in it. If you've not had sex before, but you're within the screening age, we still recommend that you have it done. And we will make sure that we do it in the most comfortable and sensitive way as possible. So cervical cancer, the reason that we do this screening is because it kills around 900 women each year, but it's largely preventable. It's preventable because we can spot cells changing before they turn into cancer and we can tackle it early. What we're looking for when we actually do the screening is not cancer cells anymore, but we're looking for a virus called the HPV virus, the human papilloma virus, and it's found in around 99% of cervical cancers. If your test comes back positive for HPV, that does not mean that you have cancer. That means that you have this virus. And so we will monitor you more closely. Most, in a lot of people, this virus actually just clears itself. Your own immune system will clear it. But 
in some people, it may go on to develop into cancer cells. And so we can catch this early. Again, looking at disparity, cervical cancer in South Asian women over 65 is twice as high as white women and much fewer Asian women and black women attend cervical screening. It is offered to everyone between the age of 24 and 49 every three years. And as you get older, between the age of 50 and 64, it's offered every five years. Now, this might change because over the last few years, we have um, introduced the vaccine for cervical cancer called the HPV vaccine. And actually, because of that, we are seeing much fewer incidences of HPV and so fewer incidences of cancer. And so cancer screening might need to happen much less frequently. If you have the virus, we've talked about the fact that you may need further testing. And this could be a colposcopy. A colposcopy is a camera test. And this just looks at the entrance of the womb in more detail. Now, there is no effective cure for HPV. And in some people, like I said, the body clears it themselves. But there is this vaccination offered to young women. And if it's something that's offered to young women and you're listening there as a mother, as a sister, as a friend, then it's worth finding out more and making sure that young women are taking this up. The final cancer that I want to just talk about, and this is common for men and women, um, and this is bowel cancer screening. Colorectal and bowel cancer is the fourth commonest cancer in the UK, but, and one in 19 women will develop this in the UK in their lifetime. So it's, it's reasonably common. Sadly, cancer survival for colorectal cancer is much lower than European average, and part of this is because we catch it at a later stage. Now, in this country, we offer bowel screening every two years. And people um, can, if they've missed it, again, there is a, um, a phone number here. Now, the, the way that the screening happens is much simpler um, than the other two, because actually you can do the screening from your own home. OK, when you reach th that age, you will get a, a, a kit in the post and you have to take a poo sample and put it in the in the sample kit and send it off. What they're looking for is blood in the stool, hidden blood that you might not be able to see with your eyes. And if they find that, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have cancer. It just means that you need further investigation. And that further investigation will be a little camera test called a colonoscopy, where a thin tube is passed inside the back passage to look for signs of cancer. So three very important things which help save lives. OK, do not ignore your invitation. If your mum, your sister, your family members, friends, if they've ignored it, if they've not had it, ask them about it. Remember that the screening is not 100% accurate. So if you have any symptoms, then do not hesitate to visit us. We are wide open for you to come and see us. And in this country, we're so privileged with the NHS that all of this is free. In other countries, this is not the case. So please take full advantage of it, talk about it, talk to your friends, family, um, and get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kathy Ben. Really grateful to you. Uh, so time is uh, really uh, pushing uh, forward to uh, seven o'clock. So without further ado, let me just bring uh, my next friend, uh, Ade um, Odenlade. Uh, he's a qualified healthcare leader with uh, uh, wealth of clinical and operational management experience gained from working in a variety of senior positions over the last 25 years within the public and private sector. He's currently the Chief Operating Officer at Derbyshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. He's been a colleague and a friend of mine for a number of years, and I know him to be highly motivated to deliver clear outcomes and results for patients with deep, deep, deep passion. So, Ede, uh, it'd be really good um, if you could just uh, uh, tell us about uh, the work that you're doing as the um, leading NHS uh, manager, please. Good evening, everyone, and a very great presentation uh, from Yoti and uh, Kati. Uh, it, that was uh, amazing because uh, I think uh, if I tell you a little story very quickly, um, my uncle died recently uh, from prostate 
And uh, just exactly what Yote was talking about, which is uh, Kete delay, felt that uh, he can just self-manage it. And, um, and by the time we, we all knew it, it was too late. So I think there is a, a message that is going through, which is uh, please and please uh, don't wait, just check it out. If in doubt, always check it out. So let me share my screen uh, in terms of uh, my presentation today. Can you all see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, I actually got this um, uh, title from uh, my old university uh, uh, article, which was talking about men and women as health and the and the gap, which is Harvard University, and um, and I was so fascinated by it because it was going to be a topic for today. Uh, and uh, one of the things. That my presentation is going to be slightly different because it won't be so clinical, but uh, goes around the divide of uh, what uh, we're talking about. Uh, so, we we for as a change. Yep. Okay. Yep. We talked about breaking taboos and so on and so forth, uh, and you'll have seen quite a wide, diverse groups on, on this uh, on this call today, and uh, you will have seen and where people don't talk about mental health, where people don't uh, talk about suicide, uh, where it's uh, is people feel it's not okay to have a bad day or to make mistakes or less than perfect. Uh, or put yourself first, uh, or ask for your personal space, or take a break, or talk about sex, uh, or talk about menstrual uh, issues, uh, and so on and so forth. Those are all taboos that are around, and I think this is opportunity by coming here today to start challenging yourself, your community, and the people around you, your family, about talking about all these things because it's really important as part of managing your health. Um, when I was reading that uh, article, it talks about our health. And uh, what we've just noticed from the presentations before is equality with a difference. It means that uh, in terms of uh, how we're faced with challenges about our health is pretty much not too uh, uh, dissimilar, it might be different. While we have prostate in men, you have menstruation in women or mammogram and all of that. But what is most important if you're going to take something away tonight is that protecting your health is gender neutral. Your biology may allow you to escape certain health problems. However, most health conditions affect both men and women in varying degrees and ways. Uh, as a mental health practitioner, you will expect me to talk a lot about mental health this evening. But uh, one of the things is that uh, talking about mental health, uh, we are equally need to talk about physical health and the two go side uh, 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 together. And it's important that uh, we take our mental health and our physical health pretty seriously. Because uh, again, when we partake in physical exercise, our body releases endorphins, which are known as good hormones, uh, which stimulates our mood. Uh, so it's really important to take seriously about uh, mental health and physical health. I thought I would also talk about aging and health. And again, we know the statistics that more and more people are getting into the older uh, age, um, we face all of those challenges. But we can all age gracefully, we can all enjoy our old age, but what is important is how do we manage our health within that. Another thing, uh, I'm rushing because uh, we're Thank on you. Uh, a rush for time. 
uh, is race and health. Uh, you will have seen over the last uh, couple of years that there are health inequalities between ethnic minorities and white groups. Uh, and the picture might be complex because you have some areas where minority groups live longer than whites. However, we do know that BME groups fare much worse than others. The patterns vary from one health condition to the next. And evidence suggests that the poorer socioeconomic positions of our BME groups is the main factor of our health uh, inequalities. And part of that is also access uh, to uh, good uh, standard of living, access to health, uh, access to a whole range of, of things. Uh, today, you will have seen the health, uh, health secretary announcing at the uh, House of Commons about uh, uh, a review of maternity care. A woman's uh, maternity experience can be positive or negative, uh, be, depending on upon emotional health and physical health. And in the immediate and long-term plan, which can also impact the infant and the wider family. So it's important that, again, in terms of maternity uh, support care, that we actually uh, try as much as possible to take all the services uh, that are out there. Um, I thought I'll share some statistics, uh, mental statistics between men and women. Uh, it affects both men and women, but not in equal measure. We know one in six had a common me mental health problem, uh, one in five women and one in eight women. Uh, <coughs> with steadily increasingly uh, differences. And we also know that there are differences in suicides uh, where there were sig significant numbers uh, of three quarters <coughs> were among men and three times as many men as women die by suicide. So I, th I think it's really important that <coughs> apology we start to close the gap. Men can change their chromosomes and genes and very few will change their hormones. Uh, still, men can catch up to women in some other areas that doesn't necessarily mean going girly, though it means following some simple rules. But men, but will men change their behavior? I don't know. It's something for you to, to think about tonight. Right. But my simple thing is avoid tobacco, alcohol, and drugs, eat well, exercise, seek joy, and share those joy with others. So not just joy, but your emotions, even your sadness, share it with others. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to stop Thank there you. because we're now Thank uh, you. seven, eight minutes to the end, Thank so you. we can have co uh, questions. So, so thank you very much for that, Ede. That really leads us nicely into the questions and answers. So we've got a few minutes left to take one or two questions. And let me just um, uh, start where you finish, Ede. So, Ede, um, you talked about uh, diet, um, uh, food, the importance of um, uh, eating well uh, and the lifestyle. And, and that was uh, the theme of our uh, conversation last month. So um, uh, starting where you are finishing, um, uh, Jyoti Ben, how important um, uh, does the role of diet play uh, in uh, um, our bladder health, our um, bowel health, our prostate health? Uh, it would be good to understand uh, um, the significance of what we eat and what we drink, please. Um, I, I is is it is it to me or you uh, to you, Jyoti Ben to begin with, please. Yeah. Thank you, Gethin Bai. That's a really that well. That's a very wide but very important question. Um, I think. I and a quick to, reply would be much yeah, appreciated. I know it's a complex to, question, but a I'm, quick reply would be appreciated. I'm going to stick to the bladder because going into bowel and everything's going to be too long. So if I stick sure. to bladder health, 
then the, the key thing is fluids. So anything that contains caffeine is an irritant to the bladder. And many of you will have noticed, particularly as we get older, that if we have a cup of coffee or a couple of cups of tea, we go for a wee. And if you do that at night, you'll need to get up at night to go for a wee. Ditto with alcohol. So all the lovely things in life are bad for you. We've all heard that before, right? So the boring things are good for you. Water, that's the best thing you can drink. But remember, like I, when I showed you the picture of all the different colours of urine, the, the concentrated urine itself irritates the bladder and is going to make you make you want to go for a wee quite a lot, make you rush to the toilet. So the best thing you can drink is water, squash, even orange juice, because it's acidic, that's going to make irritate the bladder. And if you're going to have tea, coffee, then go for the decaffeinated teas and coffees, because that's better for bladder health. And then if you're, if you're really going to still have tea and coffee, then perhaps dilute it with a glass of water afterwards. And Thank then you. the caffeine effect will wear off. Thank you. And, and uh, Cathy, and what about bowel health? Um, uh, how significant is the diet, please? Uh, diet is hugely significant. Uh, just as I mentioned, for all of these cancers, being overweight and obese actually is a risk factor in itself. So if you're doing nothing specific, what I would recommend is to make sure you're a healthy weight. And for, um, for certain communities, that BMI is lower. So looking for your height, what your weight is, and whether it's within the healthy limit is really important. Specifically, also smoking and drinking um, are big risk factors for all cancers, specifically bowel cancer as well. But um, if you are a smoker, stop. If you are drinking alcohol above the uh, advised limit, which is 14 un units for men and women, uh, then again, you need to think about reducing your alcohol intake because all of these have an adverse effect. Thank you. So um, Eddie finished um, uh, uh, his sentence by saying with this slide, with this very colourful slide about closing the gap. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and, and I think, uh, Katie Ben, you also mentioned um, uh, uh, something similar in your presentation. So, uh, of course, self-examination is important, but so is screening, um, which again, Katie Ben, you know, mentioned. So how focused are we in primary care about screening? Uh, because not everything, as he was explaining to us, can be detected um, at, uh, by uh, screening or by self-examination. And again, uh, perhaps you could pick that up for me, Cathy, and then I'll move to you, Ade. So we're really focused on um, pre preventative health in in um, in general practice. We want to stop you going to Jyoti's hospital. We want to get get it before you get here, before that happens. We work really closely with public health, and the remit of screening actually sits with public health. Um, for patients, it doesn't matter. You don't know who who's in charge of that. the The important thing from a general practice perspective is we get told if you don't attend for some of your screening and so a lot of us practices are then following up with our patients to remind them to attend so it Thank is you. really important uh, and, and Ajay uh, as a, a manager of a, a leading group of hospitals uh, in Derbyshire I wonder what work is being done uh, particularly following the lockdown situation that we have all endured uh, to make uh, the screening process that much more accessible and seamless please i think and now we we have to start uh, getting services back off a lot of people have stayed at home uh we don't know what's been happening at home uh and uh you know we've now had this about three four times when we think life is getting better we we get back in uh, knock back again but we're now beginning to open up and to start to see uh, people face to face. Uh, the other thing uh, which I always tell my team is that, uh, you know, we talked about hard to reach. Uh, I always don't believe that there are people hard to reach. I think we, maybe we are difficult to access. So it's about simplifying our access routes and making sure that no door is uh, wrong so that people can access services. 
and uh, making sure that we engage the communities uh, uh, very closely in delivering services. So all of those things we're doing now to try and push forward to make sure people have access to a whole range of things. And uh, the last two years has not been great, but uh, where, where we are, we need to push things back up and make sure Thank that you. people receive services. Thank you. If you have time, I know we are running out of time, but if we have time, I might bring Jenny and uh, Anish, uh, who works uh, in community. But let me just uh, go back to Jyoti Ben, please. Jyoti Ben, um, you started off on bladder health, and Ede was talking about the the um, impact that uh, various uh, taboo areas that we've been talking about this evening have on mental health. But, but, but what about um, uh, the other um, areas that we frequently hear about um, uh, uh, di diabetes in our communities, um, perhaps Parkinson's disease in our communities? Uh, how do those uh, uh, issues um, uh, factor you know, those um, uh, people uh, enduring with the bladder conditions, please? So um, thank you, Gitanbai. That's a really useful question. Um, we know that the nerves that get affected with um, um, Parkinson's disease do indeed start to cause problems with the bladder. And in the same way, if your diabetes is really poorly controlled, um, then it starts to affect the bladder as well. And, and then you start to get things like that foreskin issue I was showing because there's too much sugar in the urine and it's going through the pipe and it's coming out at the other end and that's never good. And you get the whole thing with lots of infections. We see a lot of people with diabetes having recurrent urinary tract infections. So, you know, get your diabetes under control. That's what Kathy Ben and primary care is all about. And they're all there. They're there to fix these things. Things so that it doesn't get so bad that you come to me in the hospital because by that stage we're looking at the complications of these very chronic conditions. Thank you. Friends, I did say that 60 minutes was never going to be enough um, for this uh, topic uh, but uh, I think um, we've got the overview from our uh, three friends and uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation um, in, in coming weeks and coming months and uh, no doubt um, all of our three friends will be uh, uh, very uh, happy to come back and, and uh, uh, assist us with our uh, conversation. But uh, let me pass you to Judith uh, to say um, a, um, a few words by way of a closing. And uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Judith, for joining us as well. Judith, your um, uh, microphone, please. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. So, wow, what thoughtful, engaging, taboo-busting talks. Absolutely um, amazing, inspiring, yeah. And, and thank you, Ketan, for bringing everyone together. It, it, really interesting perspectives. And I think there's a lot more that we can explore in subsequent conversations.